So, so uh, let's move to the next talk um, by Zura Bereziani from uh, the University of Lacula about mirror dark mat mirror matter. So first of all, thanks to Igor and organizers for inviting for this <clears throat> online meeting. And uh, I will start, okay. So everything can be explained by standard model, but there should be more than one standard model. It is sort of uh, idea. So to start from the uh, shorter, uh, we have the problems that we have dark matter and uh, baryon matter, which are in proportion nearly of the same order, 5%, 25%, as we remember. And the uh, question appears whether it is a coincidence or it is some natural reason for that, that they are not orders of magnitude different from each other. And uh, <clears throat> for that, uh, probably the best uh, possibility would be if dark matter is presented by a parallel sector, which is a similar or maybe even identical to ordinary particle sector. Only that, imagine that we have very complex physics, though it's described very simple Lagrangian of the standard model, maybe with extension by Susi, Gat, or whatever, it's all natural extensions, but. Uh, with the simple Lagrangian of the standard models, there is uh, enormously difficult physics, which is confinement, long range forces, weak interactions, parity violation, whatever it is. And what is needed in addition, some source of the baryon or B minus L violation to create baryon asymmetry. So we need that we have to go beyond standard model. So if uh, we would have dark matter of parallel sector with the same properties, we would need also the same so in a sense, we know more or less particle physics in dark sector, but we need also something like this baryon violation in the dark sector. So in that case, we would have a very simple scenario in which case we would have new parameters very much with some, in some sense, dark sector physics know already from the our physics. And uh, let's uh, extend this paradigm uh, simply because of uh, how it can work and so on. So concept is that we have uh, particles which are described by standard model and other sector of particles which are described by similar standard model. And uh, this is called mirror world, okay? At some moment it was introduced the mirror particles for the parity restoration which were violated in the weak interactions by the same Lee and Yang in the first papers and open Pomeranchu had observed they have made that this should be independent sector actually of particles without having same electromagnetic or strong interactions with our particles. Now we know that it is standard model, it is another standard model because at the time when this works were done no standard model existed. So we can imagine now that we have two Lagrangians. One describes standard particles, the standard model or its extension, another describes identical Lagrangian, describes parallel particles, and there should be some mixed terms of cross interactions by which they can interact. So mirror sector is dark because we don't see photons of mirror sectors. They have their own photon, but we don't see them. But perhaps they are gray because uh, L mixed interactions, cross interactions, they should contain portals for their detections or perhaps also astrophysical detections. So dark matter is mirror matter, it's asymmetric in the sense that it is uh, based on the baryon asymmetry, its presence as our matter, and it should be in dissipative atomic and so on, so it should have specific astrophysical consequences. And one constraint which is needed for viability of this concept is that it should be colder than our matter. Otherwise, you can exclude it immediately by uh, primordial nucleosynthesis constraints. And then why is these two sectors are identical? You simply assume that there is a symmetry under exchange of these particles reciprocally between two sectors and nothing changes. Sort of some parity, some Z2 parity between two sectors, but here is a subtlety that this parity can be imposed because of the chiral character of the standard model itself in two ways, with chirality exchange between ordinary and mirror particles or without chirality exchange. And this will make a difference. So cross interactions, 
Essentially, here we have no new parameter for describe the physics itself of the dark sector, but we have new parameters because we have new operators whatever possible cross interaction terms you can write between these particles and these particles. They are new operators and they should contain new parameters and let's agree that we limit these parameters only by experiment without prejudices. Uh, oops, what is, why it's not? Uh, by some reason I cannot move anymore. Uh, Do you hear me still? Or? Yeah, we can still hear you and see the last slide actually that you have. The, the problem is that by some reason my slide stuck and it does not want to go forward. What should I do? Try to go uh, out of full screen mode and then... Yeah, exactly. And then reload it again. Escape. How I have to go out of full screen mode? Uh, and try to make escape, but it does not allow me to. Okay. Ah, okay. Now, 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 okay. Now it moved. Okay. Now it moved. By some reason, it was simply locked. <laughs> okay. okay. Let me go. So, we know that our baryon asymmetry it is generated by Sakharov's mechanism, we don't know what is concretely this mechanism, but it's whatever it is, it's based on the idea that we should have B or B minus L violation with CP violation combined, and there should be a process which violates B and B minus L and should be out of equilibrium. And then you are predicting this number, baryon density in the universe today, which is product of the baryon number density and baryon mass, you know baryon mass and you know by many cosmological tests, also this number. So we know that it is 5% today of the universe. We know that dark matter, it is 25%. Uh, it's product of the dark matter number density and dark matter mass, but we don't know what is it. And there is a zoo of all, all, all possible particles starting from axion to Gimzilla, which spans 20 orders of magnitude or more. But uh, essentially, where I will concentrate that we will have um, particle mass 1 GV and uh, baryon density comparable to our baryon density. So it should be because of the same baryogenesis mechanism in some way. So now about two parities without, without chirality change, just to remind what is going on. We have particles which we call uh, quarks and leptons and uh, we call these particles and assigning them positive baryon and lepton numbers because Presumably because our matter is done by Z and uh, weak interactions for our, our matter, it is left-handed. But if there would be somewhere uh, antimatter island, like Sasha was talking before, then weak interactions would be right-handed, of course, because they would consist of this. These are complex conjugation fields. This is new, not new fields, but these are com complex conjugations, CP transformation from here to here, from matter to antimatter. And formally, we ascribe them also negative baryon numbers because this conjugation changes whatever notion of the quantum numbers which you assign. So let's consider now the parallel sector we will have similar particle content. But uh, I will make just by convention because it's in my hands what to call uh, baryon number. Left-handed species, which I will put here, I will assign them negative baryon numbers just by convention because I don't know what is their baryon asymmetry there. And uh, right-handed antiparticles of uh, complex conjugates of Z, I will assign positive baryon numbers, B prime numbers of the parallel sector. And now you can have uh, two types of symmetry, simple Z2, when left particles from here, you change to left particles from here. So without chirality change, you are projecting one sector, another sector of the same chirality particles. And in this case, uh, you know that uh, if not CP violation, particle and antiparticle systems would be fully identical, only that they are not really fully identical because CP violation, which has encoded in the complex phases of the Sukawa coupling constants uh, between this and that. Bars means which 
in supersymmetric language, for example, we call UC here, DC and so on. So I put bar in order not to put prime and C together. So these are Yukawa terms between this and this, essentially. So it's written in the like sort of Majorana terms, if you like, Majorana-like terms. And uh, if you make such a transformation from one sector to another, the same, same terms here, you will uh, say that the Yukawa term should be equal, simply identical. But if we assume that there is left particle from here transformed into the right particle here, then you get that this Yukawa term should be complex conjugation because it's written here in which these terms will transform here. And uh, you can distinguish it. We assign, for example, some formal quantum number like B plus B prime to all the system. Under first transformation, this B plus B prime transforms into the opposite sign, changes sign. Under this transformation, it remains invariant. And then it's not uh, difficult to notice that one symmetry, this left-right symmetry, it is simply product of this symmetry on the CP transformation and nothing more. So essentially, there are two types of symmetry and it's no, not parity restoration is also older in old times was considered because CP violation was not known at the time. So essentially, we are talking uh, in spite of the old names or whatever it's called parity restoration. It is simply symmetry. This, uh, doubling symmetry multiplied on the CP transformation. So CP is not conserved, maybe this is not conserved, but this product is a good symmetry. It can be exact symmetry. So now, uh, what we know about baryon asymmetry? Our baryon asymmetry is positive because some baryogenesis mechanism, which we don't know, produced more baryons than antibaryons in the universe. Uh, antibaryons, they will all burn, and this deficit of the uh, uh, this difference survives today, it is 10 to the minus 9 from the amount of the uh, total entropy of the universe. What, what about the baryon asymmetry in the mirror sector? We don't know, a priori. And it depends on mechanism of the baryogenesis and depends what type of the symmetry I impose. Imagine that I consider that electroweak baryogenesis works in our sector. It's all done. We know that it's not true, electro baryogenesis. but imagine some extension of standard model in which it works. And exactly the same should be physics of the mirror sector in the left basis if you assume Z2 symmetry. And in this case, since uh, to the left particles I gave the baryon number which is negative, it was my convention, in this case baryon asymmetry would be negative in that case. But if I will put this symmetry, which is identical between left and right, for right particles, I gave positive baryon prime numbers, so it will be positive baryon asymmetry. But if I don't have no cross interactions, which can transform our baryons to mirror baryons and so on, I cannot, it's all academic question because I cannot measure neither baryon asymmetry, non chirality of the sector or nothing. But if I have some interactions which can violate B and B prime, but conserve, for example, this B plus B prime, in this case, like it is neutron to mirror neutron oscillation by this mass term, which I will put here. In this case, I will say that in the first case, if I will generate baryon asymmetry negative in that sector, uh, I would have uh, uh, transformation, uh, in the, when it's positive, I will have transformation of the, me, whatever it is, um, baryon asymmetry there, they are consist of the uh, positive sign baryons and they will transform in our positive signs of baryons. So mirror matter will be transformed to our matter. But if I have opposite case, the baryon asymmetry there is negative, then essentially what is uh, baryons in that sector, for us it will be in some sense classified by this B plus B prime conserved number, antibaryons, and they will, when they will transform to my sector, they will create antibar, anti, they will transform into antineutrons, so they will create antimatter. So this is sort of uh, preliminary to say, uh, and now what about the mirror sector itself, shortly? Uh, to say, from the beginning, mirror sector, uh, it was long time ago suggested, but of course, there was some prejudice, everything is identical between two sectors, so they should have equal temperatures, and in that case, it was not maybe that dramatic at that moment, but now we know that 
if mineral sector has the same temperature, it would weight like more than six additional neutrinos. And uh, to avoid that, you have to say that temperature is smaller in the mirror sector. And the other way, if everything is equal, then baryon number should be also equal, that it's enough, it's, it's not enough to explain the amount of baryon number in the universe. But everything can be settled simply if you assume that uh, uh, temperatures are different. As in, you, you introduce a para paradigm that after inflation, two sectors were asymmetrically heated. So our sector was heated to bigger temperatures than mirror sector. And then all cross interactions between ordinary and mirror particles are weak enough in order not to bring in the later epochs to sectors in the equilibrium because you have to arrive to the nucleosynthesis without equilibrating the temperature. And uh, there is no additional entropy production uh, because of some first, first order phase transitions, which can be there, but at least, uh, okay. Uh, for, the, for the time being, what we know, there are not any stronger first order phase transitions in our standard model history. So it's a cosmological limit from the primordial nucleosynthesis, but we have to take cosmological limits if you want to build all dark matter by this mirror matter, for example, then you have to assume uh, that it's five times smaller. And if you say that only part of the dark matter is done by mirror matter, anyhow, you have to make it at least three times smaller in order not to violate the CMB tests. So what implications it has that uh, if ordinary sector, essentially, we have to require that it is colder because to maintain not no more than 25% of helium in our uh, world and 75% uh, hydrogen, because if you would make a bigger amount of this bigger temperature, so this amount of the extra uh, particles is big, then you would have more than 25% of helium. But for the mirror sector, it has opposite consequence because nuclear synthesis is going there in the pretty big half parameter when they, their temperature come close to one MeV and all this proportion is inverted. So mirror world is a helium dominated. It has 75% of helium, roughly said, and 25% of hydrogen. And uh, okay, I will not discuss anymore that if you have broken symmetry, you can have simply more compact atoms, electron mass can be 100 times smaller and the uh, baryon mass 5 GV, some atomic dark matter and so on, which we have discussed uh, uh, very early when I was still afraid of a very exact, uh, exactly symmetric uh, mirror matter. So in the next, I will discuss when actually both sectors, they have, exactly identical mass spectra, exactly identical physics. So going ahead, <clears throat> what is cosmology of the mirror world? So because of this temperature difference, uh, recombination in that sector uh, happens earlier, mirror photons decouple before matter radiation equality, and uh, this will make you uh, possibility that after their photon decoupling, this uh, mirror particles, though they are self-interacting, dissipative and so on, they will behave like uh, normal dark matter particles without having much collisions to each other. But uh, after their rayonization, presumably forming their first stars, it will still can be rayonized, they start to behave as collisional, dissipative and so on. And then it can have influence for the star formation. For example, if there is some reciprocal contact at this moment of the, uh, and uh, in any case, one can assume that mirror stars can be formed earlier because material is cold, very important that genes mass is smaller than horizon mass, even in before the matter radiation equality. Uh, silk effects are damped and uh, helium content, which makes uh, all this material more transparent. So you could form heavier stars and perhaps uh, you can form some amount of the three, five solar mass uh, objects, which will not fragment to the smaller ones and they can give seats for the central black holes. And uh, maybe central black holes can be related to this. Uh, so it's a difficult issue. So Sasha has another view that it should be all primordial. I'm less uh, pessimistic with that reason. Perhaps if you make, uh, <clears throat> proper seats of the initially big seats of the black holes, you could make that. 
what what can be halos? So of course this is problem because this is self-interacting. If it forms stars and so on, it should be disk. But there is no reason to be disk because if we are forming too much heavy stars, which which are ending up in black holes very easily because they are helium dominated, they have much less uh, uh, mass loss because of stellar winds and so on. They can easily end up, they are dominant amount of black holes, some amount can survive, we don't know what is initial mass function, it's still a difficult question, but imagine that what can be hollow in this case we use, it should be something like dominated by uh, some elliptic galaxy dominated by collisionless uh, uh, stars, which can be black holes or stars or neutron stars, which can be left over of the supernova explosion of the uh, mirror stars in the particular mass lane range, lighter ones. The heavier ones will end up in the black holes. Okay, so this is the constraints which I will I told to you about from Planck and so on. It was a long time ago done, but uh, I will go ahead. So here is micro lensing limits from much or so. St stellar mass, solar mass uh, stars cannot have by microlensing dominant amount here, but this area essentially is open. It could be uh, even all galaxy could be dominated by some 30, 100 mass, solar mass uh, objects, which presumably should be then black holes. And uh, as I told, maybe this formation of these black holes can be easier and so on. So cosmological implications I stop. Direct detections that can be by some portals interact like photon kinetic mixing between two sectors, for example. And uh, more important and in interesting, it is oscillation phenomena between ordinary and mirror particles, because any neutral particle, which neutrino can be, or neutron, in principle, they have no reason not to mix with uh, their sterile twins. But since they have the same masses, equal masses, this mean this oscillation can be with maximal amplitude between these two in the ideal conditions. So this can be very effective oscillations if oscillation time is small enough. Now, what can be the portals there? And uh, there can be uh, some difference or not between two parities. So this is kinetic mixing of photons, which essentially makes our particles merely charged with respect to the mirror photon with, or reciprocally mirror particles merely charged with this epsilon this polar parameter, which is cosmologically is limited at the level of 10 to the minus nine. But nevertheless, it can be possibility that mirror nuclei, which can be helium, for example, can scatter our nuclei in some dark matter detectors, and it can be the way to see them. So they can be Higgs-Higgs coupling, and uh, in case of asymmetric, you can naturally realize the twin Higgs model in supersymmetry because it is Lagrangian in which uh, this automatic global symmetry appears without paying any price. Uh, and what is strange is essentially twin Higgs model is not related to supersymmetric model, but I have done this before, this uh, authors of the non-supersymmetric twin Higgs model, but I did not pay much attention for that. So, and uh, there is another thing which can, in, in which case this mirror sector concept can be very useful, which can be something like uh, uh, understanding of minimal flavor uh, violation in uh, supersymmetry. You can imagine that there is a family symmetry because which is shared between two sectors. And in that case, it will be very useful to use this symmetry because uh, this family symmetry should be chiral. So fermions and antifermions, so left-handed, should be transformed as triplets because their product should not allow degenerate masses. And in that case, you have anomalies here, if it's gauge symmetry, which is mediator between two sectors. But then corresponding left-handed fermions are anti-triplets, which means that right ones are triplets, and the anomalies are cancelled of this symmetry between two sectors. And apart that, if you apply this in the supersymmetry, you discover that this flavor symmetry can make you possibility of F terms to arrange in this way. And that you will have between uh, squark masses and uh, quark Yukawa couplings, these uh, natural relations, which is alignment or trilinear terms of the, also the same thing. But uh, uh, the gauge symmetry in itself, which uh, while this mirror symmetry remains, and precise, it will also cancel D-term contribution to this flavor violation. And this is only one mechanism which I can use that 
minimal flare violation in supersymmetry you can pretty naturally realize without uh, paying any price so and it will still make SUSY to be at tap scale very natural otherwise if you will randomly take this quark masses with the line you have to go to 100 TV supersymmetries and it becomes completely useless and of course this uh, flavor bosons can mix and kk bar and uh, make some process and so on interesting they can be even at few TV scale in some particular cases, but I will not concentrate it here anymore here, because most interesting are interactions which would violate lepton sector um, and baryon numbers in two sectors. And what about that? We know that lepton number is a simply accidental symmetry, which is uh, accidentally conserved uh, in the standard model because you cannot write any renormalizable term is a Lagrangian, which would violate uh, lepton number conservation. But if you go beyond standard model, say that I will write effective operators, which is integration out of unknown physics. Next operator of dimension five, which you can write, it is operator which contains two lepton doublets and two Higgs doublets. And it violates lepton number by two units. It is Weinberg operator, famous, the guy who has first done this operator analysis of lepton and baryon number violating processes, extremely clever paper. And uh, uh, this generates neutrino Majorana mass, as we know this CSO mechanism, cut off by the scale of this operator. And then we know that this operator can be realized by millions of the different ways. And most natural one is the exchange of some heavy Majorana particle here, which we call usually right-handed neutrino, so we have not to call it like that, but okay. It has some fermion by which the, the lepton doublet has interaction with it and it generates this mass. It can be singlet of standard model or it can be triplet of standard model, for example. In any case, we will generate this operator. Now, if you have two sectors, then you should have this operator in our sector for identity of this uh, parallel sector should have this operator in the parallel sector, but also dimension five operator is allowed between two sectors. It's extra pieces written here, which is not indeed. And this is this operator, this mixed operator, which is still dimension five operator. And you could always say that if you have here singlet particles, the singlet particles, they, if they are not protected by any quantum numbers, they can equally interact also uh, with uh, mirror particles. Here you could put phi prime and L prime, and you will take this operator, will generate this operator. Of course, if it's in this operator mediated by triplet particles, you cannot do that. But if they are singlet particles, they can be mediators. So all these operators, they appear essentially of the same order. You can say they can be related. And this makes mirror neutrinos very natural candidates for sterile neutrinos. In that case, they will be, of course, must degenerate to our neutrinos. They will be too light. And uh, But if you will break the symmetries, then you could give them 10 kV masses if order of magnitude bigger uh, electroweak scale and twin Higgs model or so on. And you could have natural candidates for natural. But here I'm still continuing only with a normal case. Now, what these interactions do? First of all, they are uh, in the later universe in our laboratory, they generate neutrino Majorana masses, which we can search for, but they can also induce active sterile neutrinos, which can also search as a neutrino deficit. But in the early universe, these operators induce scattering processes of uh, lepton, lepton, two, two Higgses, for example, or lepton Higgs into the anti-lepton, anti-Higgs, and so on, which violates lepton number by two units, these operators. And these operators generate scattering lepton Higgs to the mirror lepton, mirror Higgs, and so on. Lepton number is violated by one unit in each sector. And of course, it satisfies these processes, all three conditions of Sakharov. First condition, uh, is out of equilibrium, is satisfied automatically because I already told the paradigm of the mirror model, it implies that all this interaction should be out of equilibrium after inflation, otherwise the temperatures would be equal to sectors. Second, that it violates uh, baryon neptans or in two sectors, it violates B minus L in both. 
and uh, it violates CP because essentially in this mechanism, which I told us, Yukawa coupling constants are always complex. We have to make hard work to, by some reason, declare them real because we know that Yukawa couplings are generically complex. So then you can simply take and in this scenario calculate baryon asymmetry. Okay, and we have done this uh, in 2000. This work. You, you make this uh, terms of the three level contributions to the radiative corrections, you calculate CP violating factor, and so on and so on. And you will induce baryon asymmetry in our sector. But then you can induce baryon asymmetry also in the mirror sector. So it is a cogenesis scenario. Essentially, these are these Boltzmann equations. What you assume here is that these two sectors are as, um, reheated after inflation asymmetrically. and Let's make extreme assumption, which is more natural, that by some reason there are two inflatons and only our inflaton is excited, whereas the mirror inflaton is already relaxed. We are in this patch of the universe. And uh, only our sector is heated by inflaton decay. Whereas these processes, which I told, they transform our leptons collide with Higgs and transform into the mirror leptons, mirror Higgs, then transfer, transfer some entropy to the mirror world. Of course, this should not be in equilibrium, so it should remain colder. But together with entropy, it's also a transfer of the lepton number from one to another because of the CP violation in the scattering processes. And you can calculate the CP asymmetries in the scattering processes and find that these uh, asymmetries in the uh, uh, two, um, this is parameterization of the scattering asymmetries in the scattering processes, simply the sigma and sigma prime. And yes, you can. Uh, you have to uh, speed up a bit because we have already um, exceeded the, the 30 minutes uh, limit. So, because I see there is chapter ah. two, chapter four, <laughs> chapter five. So, I start getting worried. Okay, about okay, it. I will speed up. Okay. Uh, so, uh, what is interesting in the case of the Z2 symmetry, you don't generate anything, it's simply vanishingly zero. Whereas uh, in the case of the mirror symmetry, you generate exactly this opposite sign of baryon asymmetry. And what is interesting is in the case you have simply a good number for baryon asymmetry and you can have also bigger baryon asymmetry in the mirror sector. Now, uh, I will go faster ahead and imagine now that I have also neutron, uh, mirror neutron mixing. This is mirror neutron anti neutron mixing. This is dimensional nine operator. At the same ground, I can write this operator which concerns B plus B prime. Okay. And the difference is that between these two, that uh, this operator which mixes neutron to, mirror, uh, to anti neutron, uh, this mixing mass is limited very strongly because of the direct experiment and because of the nuclear stability limits. And it should be less than 10 to the minus 24. But if you look what is for the uh, neutron mirror neutron oscillation, you find out that there is no limit for, uh, uh, from uh, nuclear stability because uh, simply it's absolutely uh, by energy conservation is not possible. Uh, this process is irrelevant for the nuclear stability. Whereas for direct uh, experimental limits, you can allow still neutron uh, mirror neutron oscillation time as small as one second or a few seconds, which, uh, which uh, uh, is not excluded by experimental data. And uh, I will, oops, uh, I will go to experimental limits, which they are uh, simply uh, to, to show that these are, uh, uh, okay, these are, um, okay, let me believe that it's, it's done, okay. Uh, still few seconds can be allowed by experiment. Question is only that, uh, why it's allowed? Because it's, uh, they are suppressed by envi environmental reasons, by magnetic fields, by matter and so on. And uh, it's only for free neutrons. So free neutrons, you can find only reactors or spallation facilities in cosmic rays or in BBN, but also it can be effective in the neutron stars. And neutron stars in particular, you can have transformation because you have this mixing Lagrangian between two sectors and you have energy splitting, even masses are equal. You have potentials, optical potentials because a neutron coherently propagate, coherently interacts with uh, 
nuclear matter inside, and it is this optical potential where it is scattering lengths and so on. It is about 100 MeV at the nuclear densities, supranuclear densities. Whereas uh, this mirror neutron has no potential essentially inside. And then they have mixed because you can calculate what are out of state, against states, and you can create by the scattering process, two neutron scatter, and you can create. And you, essentially, you start to populate neutron star by mirror neutrons, if you like. And these are this Boltzmann equation. You have to calculate this rate of the mirror neutron production, and it is the answer. Essentially, it is depending on the mixing mass in the units of 10 to the minus 15 electron volts, which corresponds to the one second of the oscillation times. And essentially, at that experimental limit, which we, where we are now, it is 10 to the 15 years. So it's four orders of magnitude bigger than the universe age. And essentially, it can be completely, um, how to say, uh, unobservable. It's not true because this transition produces energy of this order and about few percent of this energy is produced uh, in terms of heating of the neutron star and essentially this neutron star heating can put the limit equal comparable to the experimental limits 10 to the minus 15 electron volt so it is energy mostly emitted in terms of the um, mirror neutrons and mirror photons and mirror neutrinos because we are producing mirror neutron with typical Fermi energy in this degenerate gas which is 100 MeV. Now what was the case? We are making the transformation from full neutron star. You are burning, burning here, uh, creating inside the core of the normal star and so on and uh, at asymptotes you can transform in the 50-50 mixed star, which will be simply square root of two rescaled configuration of this. It is mathematically precise results. So maximal mass also, uh, which is allowed by given equation of state will be by square root of two reduced as a radius also should be reduced by square root of two. But this I will skip. This is, this is evolution process. Imagine that you have density profile in the initial star, which is Z. And uh, after some time you are creating the small amount of the mirror matter inside this is its profile whereas the rest is not almost changes they are coinciding then you are going and by time the star shrinks and at the end it will go to this green configuration when two components are equal and of course you are also difference between this initial mass and the sum of these two initial masses it is 0.1 solar masses which is corresponds to the gain in the gravitational bending energy now, uh, what can be, uh, I will end up by this last transparency. Uh, if you take uh, mergers, you have a merger of the uh, imagined mirror neutron stars reciprocal process, in which case you have uh, our uh, neutron star or anti-neutron star inside, antimatter star. It's a small core of the antimatter, which is here. Maybe it's not even neutronized because it's still present in the uh, terms of the heavy nuclei inside because the uh, nucleosynthesis processes are going very intensively here. And when you have this merging, these two drops, they collide and merge in one, but these ones, they are not binded there by forces. They simply continue their path like slings, they continue. And of course, by the compression, because they are leaving this site of the strong gravitational potential, they will explode. And they will produce whatever nuclei they are here, they can be thrown away by this decompression. And uh, of course, it can be this collapse of the neutron stars. They can explain this unusual merger of the neutron stars, which LIGO has observed so on, but it, it's not the point. By that reason, you can create anti-nuclei, which can be, well, there are rumors that uh, IMS2 observed anti-helium and so on and so on. If so, then I would say that maybe IMS2 they should observe also anti-carbon and so on because we have to create a lot of nuclei. Normally they are unstable in the normal conditions, they will decay, but more than helium, they cannot decay anyhow with carbon and so on. And this last transparency, which about Sasha has taught, it is this 14 events which uh, these people has observed there because now I have exactly this situation. I have uh, mirror neutron star in which I have antimatter core, provided that baryon asymmetry is negative in the mirror sector. 
And this is case, of course, this is mirror baryon production rate, and our antibaryon production rate in the mirror star, and it depends on this epsilon. It is a number 10 to the 34 in per second. Whereas it is accretion rate, which depends on the velocity of star and the interstellar um, density and so on. And uh, this number for these numbers is comparable. Essentially, they're comparable. If I will take here 10 kilometers per second, they would become comparable. And uh, if I will assume that uh, on this core created by antimatter, the accreted uh, baryons from interstellar medium are annihilating, then I will get such a flux which is normalized to 50 parsec distance. So it is 10 to the minus 12, which is observation limit for this analysis, which is people has used. Uh, because you cannot resolve, uh, sky is very complex. And they have seen this 14 unusual uh, events, which had uh, um, this characteristic, the, their spectrum were uh, uh, sort of, compatible with the baryon antibaryon annihilation spectrum with typical maximum at 17 mv and then falling down and without tail beyond gv so this is alternative and what is interesting also is that if you will um, consider the merger rates of the neutron stars estimated uh, by ligo and multiply onto the 10 to the 52 which is amount of baryons, which you could, antibaryons, which you could produce inside the neutron star. You would get good number for the flux of the antihelium, which this uh, eight events or whatever was observed by IMS, which is not yet uh, published and so on. These are just still rumors and so on for already a few years, but anyhow. And uh, alternative, as Sasha has discussed, it is anti-stars. And question is whether one can distinguish one from another. Probably yes, but uh, more resolution is needed because in my case, it should be a surface redshift because this annihilation spectrum, because we are emitting uh, this from the surface, which is inside the neutron star and the gravitational potential is about minus 0.3 there. Uh, essentially, you would have uh, about uh, exponent of this number uh, uh, suppression of the redshift uh, of the uh, photons produced on the surface and uh, it would be something like uh, depending on the mass of the neutron star it can be 15 30 percent effect anyhow uh, also difference is that mass range it can be here only between one and two solar masses because neutron stars cannot have bigger mass so uh, otherwise they would collapse and uh, will take everything with it so it is uh, as i will finish with that okay Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Zurab, for this nice talk. Um, is there any question, actually? Um, we have time for one fast question, or maybe two. Um, Inar. Uh, yes, so, so, yeah, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. I have a question about the um, mixing of uh, ne mirror neutrinos and uh, normal neutrinos. Uh, can this uh, process heat up the mirror uh, world somehow? Because you have uh, normal normal matter, which is very hot. We have this mixing. Can you heat up it? And then it can again uh, give too much of an effect? Uh, no, but by assumption, it cannot heat up because I told that it depends which is reheating temperature and which is the mass scale of the uh, heavy neutrinos which are mediating this operator. So if these masses are bigger than the reheating temperature, it will not bring them into equilibrium by these processes. And oscillations you have to take care later on, but uh, this depends on the delta M square between these two. And you can always arrange the delta M square is small enough. Okay. And we have a okay. question from uh, Igor. Uh, yes, um, I, I have a question, but I think I, I already got an answer myself, but still I, I, I will tell. Looking on this map, I saw this, this map confirms Sasha's idea and contradicts to yours. But I guess you would say that uh, mirror 
neutron stars are distributed in a halo. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Our neutron stars are also distributed in halo. No, but uh, no. Our they are in the disk. Our neutron stars, if there you are, but majority will be in the disk. No, no, wait, wait. Uh, I'm talking about the observation distance 50 parsec. If you go and look what are distribution of our close by neutron stars, you will see exactly this picture. But try to do this. Look, I know distribution of pulsars. They are all exactly in the... distribution of pulsars go to close by pulsars. They are in the disk. No. If you go to the far distance pulsars, the 10 kilo parsec distant pulsars and so on, you will see the essential. You are talking about 50 parsec. A 50 parsec you will see like that. A ah, parsec, okay. Small, close by pulsars, you will see that picture. But, but they discovered it only uh, antimatter stars only in, in the close vicinity, not far away. Well, you see, uh, I have written here that distance by which you can observe below the, uh, above the observation limit, it is 50 parsec here. Of course, if I can enhance this luminosity by some reason, because I cannot make bigger than that. In any case, you cannot make bigger than that because it's determined by the accretion rate. Of course, I can make it bigger if it's a 10 kilometer velocity. I can make orders of magnitude, three orders of magnitude bigger this. The closest neutron star is 120 parsec or something. Sorry? The, the closest neutron star to us is... closest so neutron star, it is 90 parsec. Okay. Yeah. So it is, uh, you can imagine a 50 parsec, but it's closest pulsar. But we see uh, 300 uh, neutron stars, we see one pulsar. So assumption it is that 50 parsec is typical distance between the neutron stars. Moreover, that you already have answered that neutron stars there also should be distributed more in halos than in disk. Mirror stars. Yes, because I told that halo is done by mirror stars. Yeah, yeah. And okay. I have to, of course, hard work to make this ma their mass function to make compatible, but you see, neutron stars, they are about 10 to the eight or between 10 to the eight, 10 to the nine in uh, our neutron stars in the Milky Way. And if the corresponding amount of the neutron stars are there, you can have, uh, uh, let's say a few percent of the halo in these terms. Whereas the rest should be heavier ones, presumably black holes in this case. Okay. Um... Thank you very much, Zurab. Uh, uh, thanks a lot for the, for the nice talk.